My name is Han So Lem. I'd like you to know a little bit about my life. I was born on January 5, 1880 on the family farm called Toland in Norway. The red X marks the farm. It is located on the island of Radoy, in the town of Munger, and in the county of Hordalon. The church in the foreground is where I was baptized on February 1, 1880. My parents and many of my ancestors are buried in the cemetery next to the church. My parents were Jacob Erickson Soland and Helena Hans' daughter Nordry Solon. I have no photos of my mother. This photo is of my father, Jacob, with his third wife, Carrie. Jacob was six feet, two inches tall with strong, broad shoulders and thick, black, curly hair. He was the tallest and strongest man in the neighborhood. Because of this and his quick temper no one dared to fight him. Helena was a small, intelligent, quiet, good-looking, blonde girl and she loved Jacob. Helena was also the daughter of a rich farmer who owned much land. Her father did not wish his daughter, Helena, to marry a poor hoosman. A hoosman is a person who rents his land or works for someone else on their land. Nevertheless, they were married July 2, 1877 and Munger when he was 27 years old and she was 24. Jacob bought the land which his father had been renting and they lived there. This marriage was blessed with seven children, five boys and two girls. I was the second child born to this marriage. Unfortunately, my mother passed away from pneumonia when she was 37 years old on March 26, 1891 and I was 11. On June 9, 1892, my father married for the second time to Signe Karlstadter Kartvet when he was 42 years old and she was 36. I gained two more siblings from this marriage. Again death entered the Soland home. Signe passed away January 26, 1901 from bronchitis at the age of 39. On April 12, 1902, my father married for the third time to Carrie Monstadter Solheim when she was 36 years old and my father was 52. Four boys and one girl resulted from this marriage. In all I had 13 siblings. The photo is of Jacob with his third wife, Carrie. Left to right are Olav, Karl, Mons, Jacob, Wilhelm, Carrie, Helena, and Trina. My father died at the age of 86 on February 2, 1936 and his third wife, Carrie, died at the age of 89 on March 27, 1955. As a small boy I was one of the more fortunate because I was able to attend school. I went to school until I was 15 years old. During this time, I worked on the farm with my father, Jacob. When I was a little older, I began an apprenticeship in a blacksmith shop owned by my uncle, Unanias Erickson. He was my father's brother. The photo is of Unanias. I intensely disliked the blacksmith work for it was hard and the hours were long. I was always hungry and did not get enough food to eat for a growing boy. Many times I fell asleep on the workbench. My grandmother thought ten hours of work was a very short day. In time this feeling of discontent led me to seek a better fortune. I had corresponded with A.K. Oswald, my father's cousin, who bought my ticket to the United States. The photo is of A.K. Oswald. At twenty years of age, on April 14, 1900, I left Norway and sailed for America arriving in New York City on April 27, 1900 on board the RMS Lucania. From New York I traveled by train directly to Cloquet, where Mr. Oswald and my brother, Edward Jacobson Solem, lived. I was proudly wearing the ring my father gave me on departure. I never took this ring off and wore it all my life. He gave identical rings to all his sons when they left Norway. Inside the band is the inscription Fra Far. In English this means from father. My first objective after arriving in Cloquet was to pay Mr. Oswald for his ticket. One of my first places of employment was the sawmills. I did till sawing for which I received 17 cents per hour. Some days I would only be paid $1.65 for 11 hours of work. The biggest wage was $2 for one day's work. One summer it became so dry that they could not get the logs to the sawmills. Ed and I decided to get to the Dakotas to earn some extra money. There we went from farm to farm helping with the harvesting. The photo is of Ed and me. 
Ed is on the right and I am on the left. For a winter I worked in the woods as a lumberjack. At this time the lumber industries in Cloquet were just beginning. Out in the lumber camp, shelters had not been built. I and the other men slept in tents around a fire which was kept burning all night to keep the wolves away. In time the shelters were built and the men were glad for they no longer had to endure the cold. It was not long, however, before the lice, common to lumber camps, started bothering us. I boiled my underwear, but it was of no use, as soon as I put on clean clothes, new multitudes of lice swarmed into them. The photo is of lumberjacks washing clothes. Finally, I became so thin that I could not hold out any longer. I left the camps and went back to town. Back in Cloquet, Mr. Oswald and I formed a partnership and went into the grocery store business. We weren't very successful and soon dissolved the partnership. After the first attempt at business, I ventured into a new enterprise. Andrew Syme, a cousin, and I leased the Oswald house from Mr. Oswald. The photo is of Andrew Syme. Our rates were $3.50 a week for board and $4 a week for both room and board. Most of the people who stayed at the Oswald house were men who worked in the lumber camps. When these men first began working, Andrew and I extended them credit for their room and board because salaries were paid only once every six weeks. Some of the men would stay only long enough to collect their wages and then would leave without paying their bills. We lost a considerable amount of money this way. During the first year of business, we averaged only 50 cents per day in wages for ourselves. Because we had done so poorly in our first year of business at the Oswald House, Andrew decided to seek his fortune elsewhere and left me alone to manage the business. In the succeeding years, business improved. I had learned by experience how to manage a boarding house properly. The picture is of the Oswald House with two stories. The man in the light-colored suit is A. K. Oswald. As most businesses, the boarding house had its ups and downs. One year when business was very poor, I decided I had better learn how to cook. After I felt certain I could handle the cooking in the Oswald house, I fired the cook, thus saving myself her wages. This same cook had once thrown a butcher knife at me and I had since then never felt quite safe in her presence. One day we had some fresh fish which the cook felt I should clean. I told her that it was her job and that she was being paid to do such things. When I turned to leave the kitchen, a butcher knife landed in the door frame next to my ear. The cook was hot-tempered. The photo is of the Oswald house with three stories. During this time period I made three land purchases. On June 28, 1902 I purchased lot 16, block 15 at 26, 13th Street for $50 from the Northern Lumber Company. I sold this land to Alfred Lumpia for $200 on July 15, 1910. Also on June 28, 1902 I with my brother, Ed, purchased Lot 15, Block 12 at 1103 Carlton Avenue from the Northern Lumber Company and sold it on March 20, 1915 to Frank E. Rader for $300. I purchased land in Texas December 20, 1912 for $900 which I never sold. This land produced oil and provided a good income. On March 5, 1909 I arrived in New York City on board the RMS Lusitania after visiting in Norway. This ship was sunk in 1915 by German torpedoes. I returned to Norway to see family and also attend the wedding of a good friend, Stora Christ. My ticket cost $51. On October 19, 1909 I became a naturalized citizen of the United States. During this process I wrote to Norway for my birth record. I was surprised to find I had a middle name. My name is Hans Andreas Jacobsen Solem. By now I was using the name, Solem, as my surname. I entered the United States using the name Hans Jacobsen. Soon I added the farm name to my name and became Hans Jacobsen Solend. So many fellow Norwegians teased me about that name. It means, the sun. As a result my brothers and I all agreed and we changed our surname to Solem. 
In this time period I became a charter member of the Sons of Norway Heimsen Lodge 15 in Cloquet where I served as president. I also sang in the Viking Chorus which was a part of the lodge. When I returned to Cloquet after my visit in Norway, I found a new girl working in the dining room of the Oswald House. This girl was Lucy Marie Carlson whom I later married. The wedding was held September 11, 1911 at 8 in the evening. Our wedding was one of the largest at that time. 125 guests were invited to the ceremony and the reception which was held at the Oswald House. We were married in the Norwegian church by Rev. T. T. Roan and the ceremony was held in English. Lucy and I rode to the reception in a hack carriage. There were so many at the reception that extra girls had to be hired to serve tables. The gala affair was marred by one slight incident. Two of the girls who were hired to serve left in the middle of the reception. Their boyfriends had come by train from Duluth, 20 miles away, to be with them for the evening. The girls' disappearance left them shorthanded at the reception, but the girls left managed to carry on by themselves and everyone departed happy. This is a photo of Lucy and I with our attendants. Our attendants were Marie Leland, Yo Ah Kim So Lem, Chris So Lem and Julia Oswald. Lucy and I were blessed with two daughters, Helen Louise born July 15, 1912 in Cloquet and Lillian Irene born March 31, 1917 in Cloquet. Helen was a large healthy baby but Lillian was so small we could fit her in a cigar box. In this time period I purchased a Studebaker car. This is a photo left to right of Oli Lindemo, myself and my brother, Anania Solom. We look quite dapper in our driving clothes. Lucy and I settled into our lives with our two daughters and continued to operate and live in the Oswald house. For the Diamond Jubilee of Cloquet the following was written about me, Mr. Hans J. Solom the proprietor of this hotel is a native of Norway, a thorough businessman and a genial and efficient host who works incessantly to promote the highest comfort for his guests. He gives courteous and prompt attention to all comers, striving to anticipate and provide for their every need. On October 12, 1918 a monumental disaster disrupted our quiet lives. Lillian was just one and a half years old and Helen was six years old. The photo left to right is, Helen, Lucy and Lillian. They are close to the age they were on that fateful day. That morning we woke to find the sun trying in vain to shine through a heavy veil of smoke. There had been talk for days of a forest fire which was heading in the direction of Cloquet, but most people felt it would die out before it would ever reach Cloquet. Now it was certain. The fire would reach Cloquet by the end of the day. The mill whistles were tied in the open position and telephone operators manned their switchboards trying to reach every person in Cloquet. These operators stayed until they finally boarded the last train out of Cloquet. I was a town alderman on the town council and I also owned a car. I felt it my responsibility to help as many people as I could. I spent the entire day driving people from the edges of Cloquet, population 9000, to the train depot where an array of trains waited. They were gathered by the station agent and fortunately provided the needed transportation. While I was gone, Lucy was packing what she felt we could take in the car. She also dug a hole in her garden and lined it with wet sheets. Some of the things she buried were her china and silverware. Also included was Helen's copper piggy bank with many copper pennies inside. This bank melted to one solid mass. The photo is of what remains of the piggy bank. In the hurried process of packing to leave Lucy forgot diapers for Lillian. When they got to Carlton, she improvised by tearing up her petticoats into diapers. During the process of transporting people to the train depot, I went to check on my brother, Ed, and his family. The photo is of Ed and his second wife, Margreta. When I arrived, I found they had already departed in a carriage which Ed took from our brother, Bunanias livery stable. His son, John, had worn his Boy Scout uniform which I had purchased for him. He wanted to save his uniform. 
I checked their house and methodically closed all the windows and locked the front door. The laugh was on me. There was no house left. The children in the photo are left to right, John Solom, Anna Munger, Helen Solom and John Munger. Lucy said later that she was getting very concerned because I had not come for them. I did cut it close as even little Helen remembers the treetops in flames as we departed for the short drive to Carlton, Minnesota just five miles away. This fire became known as the Fire of 1918. After spending a week in Carlton, we returned to Cloquet to find it bare and desolate with only charred remains. One major building remained, the Garfield School. It was used as an emergency hospital. It was necessary because people were fighting the Spanish flu. Also to add to the difficult situation was the fact that it was World War I and many fathers and sons were gone. Fortunately, no one in our immediate family got the flu. The Cloquet Fire was an immense forest fire caused by sparks on the local railroads and dry conditions. The fire left much of western Carlton County devastated, mostly affecting Moose Lake, Cloquet, and Kettle River. Cloquet was hit the hardest by the fires. The fire began around midday on Saturday, October 12, 1918. By 3 a.m. on Sunday, all was over. It was the worst natural disaster in Minnesota history in terms of the number of casualties in a single day. In total, 453 people died and 52,000 people were injured or displaced, 38 communities were destroyed, 250,000 acres were burned, and $73 million, $1.315 billion in 2022 United States dollars, in property damage was suffered. The Red Cross responded immediately to the disaster. They provided us with necessities and also the lumber to build a shack. We received enough lumber to build a 12 by 16 shack which was what was allowed for a small family. I made certain that our shack had indoor plumbing. The photo is of a Red Cross shack, 100 years old, located in Moose Lake, Minnesota. For a long time there was a dispute amongst the mill officials over whether the mills should be rebuilt in Cloquet. The great stands of white pine which were Cloquet's lifeline were now gone. Finally the officials decided to rebuild, but I had gambled and decided to build Hotel Solem before I knew the decision of the mill officials. It was February 4, 1919 that work began on the hotel and it opened its doors for business on June 1, 1919. The hotel is situated on the lot where the Sons of Norway Lodge stood before the fire. I purchased the lot from the Sons of Norway. The ledger begins with, I, H, J. So Lem has this day opened a hotel business in a three-story brick building situated on the corner of 10th Street and Cloquet Avenue in the city of Cloquet, state of Minnesota with the following resources and liabilities. The car parked alongside of the hotel is my Studebaker. It was the car that brought us to safety in Carlton during the fire. Business was good and in 1923 an addition was completed on the hotel which doubled its size. In July 1929, Lucy and I traveled to Norway aboard the RMS Berengaria. We visited Finland and Lucy found her mother's baptismal record. Lucy became ill while we were in Norway and wanted to return home immediately. I tried to tell her that we should wait for a larger ship for a smoother crossing but she didn't want to wait. As a result with her feeling ill already, it was compounded by a rough crossing. Lucy didn't want to ever return again. I had a wonderful time visiting family and friends. The snapshot left to right is of my brother, Rasmus, my sister, Helena, myself, my father, Jacob, my brother, Carl and his wife, Hilder. This was the last time I saw my father. On October 24, 1929 the stock market crashed and it was the beginning of the Great Depression. Business was so bad I had to close the entire third floor of the hotel. Hungry people lined up at the back door of the cafe looking for food. In that time period, I do believe I fed more people out the back door of the cafe than through the front door. 
The photo is my family. Back row left to right, Helen and Lillian. Front row left to right, myself and Lucy. Helen graduated from high school in 1930. I had a deep desire for her to go to St. Olaf College. I thought she wasn't interested as she chose to attend a business school in Duluth. We didn't communicate well as Helen also wanted to go to St. Olaf. She didn't ask because she knew business was so bad. Finally the subject was discussed and Helen enrolled at St. Olaf the fall of 1931. She graduated in June 1935 and was the first member of my family to graduate from college. The photo is of Helen when she graduated from St. Olaf. Lucy and I attended Helen's graduation. This photo is left to right, Helen, Helen's roommate, Eleanor Hatfield, myself, Lucy and Helen's roommate, Margaret Olson. For a graduation gift Lucy and I gave Helen a new car. She was very happy and with this new car made two trips. One to the west coast and the other to Mexico. Around 1950 Lucy and I purchased a home at 22 12th Street in Cloquet. We were slowly approaching retirement. We enjoyed our retirement with several trips to Florida and one to Cuba. I also returned to Norway for one last visit on August 4, 1950. This time I went by airplane. The photo is of Lucy and me. I am napping in my favorite chair in the hotel lobby. I always sat there until one day lightning struck the hotel chimney, traveled down to a drinking fountain located just in front of me on my left. The lightning bolt jumped straight across to the door knob on Parlor A. You can see the door frame to Parlor A in the photo. I never sat in that chair again. I was bothered by glaucoma. I was diagnosed when the girls were fairly young. My first eye exploded in my head from the increased pressure. Ever since I have worn a glass eye. On a return check for my eyes in Duluth, the doctor told me I needed surgery on my remaining eye immediately. He said I could wait long enough for my wife and daughters to come so I could see them for one last time. He couldn't guarantee I would have any sight left after surgery. I told him to go ahead with the surgery and not wait for my family. The surgery saved some of my vision. I had tunnel vision but with a magnifying glass I could still read the stock market returns in the newspaper. This remaining vision also detected damage to the chimney of the hotel. I was walking from home to the hotel when I spotted the fact that lightning had hit the chimney. I never drove a car again. Lucy did all the driving. In the photo we are standing in front of our car. In 1957 I turned over the operation of the hotel to my daughter, Helen. At this point I was fully retired. In all seven Solom brothers immigrated to the United States. One brother, Rasmus, returned to Norway but the other six remained. In the photo is front row left to right, Yo Ah Kim, frequently called Joe, Edward called Ed, and myself. In the back row left to right are, Olav, Anna Nias, frequently called Andrew, and Wilhelm called Bill. Ed, Bill and myself lived in Cloquet. Ed was a police officer and Bill worked at the Diamond Match Company. Andrew homesteaded in South Dakota and had a sizable ranch. Joe lived in North Dakota most of his life where he was a sheriff and then retired to California. This photo was taken in North Dakota when we all managed to get together. We all had successful lives. Thank you for spending some time with me learning about the Solom family, our origins in Norway and the New World. I have enjoyed sharing my story with you.